Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical. I hope the week's gone well. Let me start with some home thoughts. And this image shows Olba Noti and a young female from the NQU Nai Pride Mating. It's called Lions Mating, taken by Jose Fragoso, whose photograph I showed you a couple of days ago with the lion asleep next to the zebra he had brought down. And Jose is very talented, actually. I had a good fortune to see some of his photos up close a few months ago. And then sticking with lions, this is a resting lion who gave a resting lioness a most intense glare. She responded by opening her mouth, standing tall and facing the angry appearing suitor. Intimacy soon followed. It's called prelude to intimacy. Rather good, I thought, as well. Astronomers just got the most detailed look ever at a black hole ripping a star into shreds. And that took me to one of my favourite quotes from Rumi, we come spinning out of nothingness, scattering stars like dust. This is the recording of the sandstorm within the Nairobi area from a plane that was just about to land at Wilson Airport, rather dramatic, from Mukani Wa Embu. And that took me back to the 1st of April, when I was speaking about there being a fin de siècle, even apocalyptic mood of foot. And if you went to social media after that dust storm, that's exactly how a lot of people interpreted it. And then recently I wrote this article, The End Is Nigh, which was talking about Umga, the environment, and so forth. A new YouGov poll gives the Conservatives 34%, the Lib Dems 23%, Labour 21%, the Brexit Party 12 and the Green Party 5 that's from Bruce at Reuters, and I watched the party conference, and really quite unbelievable in the sense that it's much more multiracial, the Conservative Party, than I can ever recall. Um, and uh, I'm still thinking around what Boris has proposed, and the first takeaway is how much more conciliatory everyone has become. And uh, I was speaking with a friend of mine who's, the rep who's an EU ambassador within Africa, and he said, look, you know, um, uh, there's a sense now that really, you know, it is a fait accompli. And I think the Europeans probably just want to be uh, shot of the situation as well. So I think we, it's interesting just to feel the tone around it. And uh, I don't know precisely about the merits of his two border plan. But reading the language, Juncker's response, uh, Barnier, um, only Guy Verhofstadt, I think, seemed sceptical. But overall, I think Boris might well have threaded this needle. And I'm still thinking my way through what that it precisely means for the markets. The chances of Republicans deserting Trump are underrated, says the Financial Times. Upon dismissing his chief of staff in 1973, Richard Nixon said that he loved him like my brother. And it took me back to my first boss, Al Noranji, and he said to me, Ali Khan, however brilliant you are in any organization, you are at the end of the day dispensable. And I've never forgotten that. Um, in this article, there is another scenario, though, and it does not stop at one or two Republicans peeling away. Instead, to save itself, the GOP establishment might desert Mr. Trump as swiftly and unexpectedly as it bent the knee to him in 2016. Um, in parts of the country, support for Mr. Trump is as bottomless as the hype implies. In Washington, it can be gossamer thin. What might cause it? Were public opinion to turn decisively for impeachment, the first polls merely lean that way, 
it would focus minds. Would Mr. Trump's behavior to deteriorate? And I think, you know, I made that connection with J. Alfred Prufrock and uh, his behavior has been quite extreme, um, particularly Unger blocking off a 16-year-old girl uh, who was entering the room at the same time, turning up 25 minutes late at a press conference I was waiting to listen to late at night, and I remember. And um, so I, I think his behavior is actually the Achilles heel here. And, you know, the pressure is clearly building. So were his behavior to deteriorate, his staff would have to decide whether to risk ensnarement in the mess. What puts put the likes of Haldeman in jail was not Watergate, Watergate itself, but the efforts to cover it up. And that was under a president with some grounding in the rules. Very important point. Mr. Trump, in neophyte in Washington, often appears sincerely dumbstruck by the illegality of certain actions. And that's why I said it's so Shakespearean. He's going to drop himself in it. It's not going to be anybody else. And that's the Trumpian flaw in his character. Three years on, she's a non-factor, talking about Hillary Clinton and the fact that, you know, it was her being his adversary which kind of consolidated his support because she was disliked so intensely. Perhaps conservatives can summon the same dread for the prospect of President Elizabeth Warren uh, or President Joe Biden. Otherwise, Trump cannot terrorize them into loyalty merely by brandishing the alternative. The president's transactional worldview always implied the possibility of his own abandonment. Once he stops being useful to people, by his own logic, they have no reason to stay loyal. He does not offer a relationship much deeper than what an heir in this Latinism is getting, quid pro quo. End of the year last year, I was quoting a fellow in the Washington Post who was saying he's trapped. He's playing poker, holding two threes, and suddenly putting all of his chips in. It's pure emotion, the mark of a panicking amateur. And that took me back to, we used to play a game called Red Eye, where you play around the table, you each get a card. You don't know what your card is. You've got to, you put it on your forehead. Everyone else can see each other's cards, but not their own. And you're betting on that basis. And of course, the worst card would be a two or a three, naturally. And it just reminded me of that, you know, people who had a two and a three, and you've got to be so quiet because they're betting on, you know, you might have a four and a five and a six, as you can imagine. Uh, Hervé Kofefe in full combustion, a total meltdown, and he's referencing the press conference with the Finnish president. Trump berated Jeff Mason after Mason pressed him to actually answer the question he asked. He never does. The Finnish president can't help but chuckle. The Finnish president was all of us at Trump's latest unhinged press conference. Haaretz, which writes with a degree of independence I don't find in much Israeli media, says the anti-Iran alliance is faltering as Netanyahu, Trump and MBS focus on their own predicaments. The three leaders who have led the anti-Iran line in recent years were each absorbed in his own domestic crisis this week. Trump facing an impeachment inquiry, uh, Netanyahu's lawyers reported Wednesday to the first meeting of a pre-indictment hearing on three separate corruption cases, MBS embarrassed by the mysterious shooting death of the personal bodyguard to King Salman. Saudi Arabia also facing renewed global criticism on the anniversary of the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Then, not only did the sophisticated and destructive attack on the Saudi oil facilities last month pass without a military response from Riyadh or Washington, 
But Saudi Arabia even made it clear that it supported dialogue with Tehran. The US and Iranian presidents almost met face to face. According to Politico, it was Rouhani, not Trump, who backed out at the last moment. Then going back to uh, Iran, Tehran found itself in an inferior position after Trump's controversial decision to withdraw from the nuclear agreement in May 2018. The economic crisis seems to be unbearable. The U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo presented a 12-point plan to create maximum pressure on Iran. And many people viewed this as a step intended to bring about regime change in the end. The 13th of May, I said Trump has been a big proponent, proponent of coercive financial and sanction warfare, and, it's, and that its expression vis-a-vis -vis Iran is, un, is its apogee, and that this level of financial and coercive sanction warfare was simply unprecedented. Um, so therefore, you know, you had this uh, huge amount of pressure that they seem to have somehow borne, and they've come back, uh, you know, off the ropes. It's just amazing. Almost a year and a half later, things look a little different. Trump has avoided military action against Iran, justifiably fearing being caught in a regional war in the Middle East and is avidly wooing Rouhani in the hope of a meeting with him that might lead to a renegotiated nuclear agreement. Then, quoting uh, General Draw Shalom, the commander of military intelligence's research division, he sounded rather pessimistic. The picture is much gloomier, he told the journalist Yoav Limor. In the end, everything revolves around Iran over the entire field in its efforts to establish itself in Syria and Iraq, in the attempts to transfer advanced weapons to Hezbollah. We are facing Iran on a dangerous curve and need to hold on to the steering wheel very tight. Shalom hinted that Iran is delivering cruise missiles to Syria and Iraq and described as a very reasonable option the possibility that Iran would launch cruise missiles, surface-to-surface -surface missiles or drones from western Iraq into Israel to avenge the recent attacks against it. In light of the capabilities the Iranians demonstrated in their recent attack against Saudi Arabia, this sounds like a very relevant warning. He described the Iranian threat as an enormous security challenge that is coming closer to us at incredible speed, and it is already here. Uh, unusually, the Iranians themselves have been taking photographs and plastering it all over social media. This is the Iranian Supreme Leader Khamenei, Hassan Nasrallah, who is a formidable adversary, as Netanyahu has found out, and Qasem Soleimani, who is the leader of this asymmetric military response, which has been so mind-bogglingly effective in the last few weeks. They are the ones leading the counterattack and seemingly prepared to pop over the radar. 17th of June, I was quoting Stratfor, who was saying, the overwhelming confidence that Iran is displaying both in rhetoric and action is just astounding. Interesting report in uh, saying that the asymmetrical tactics of the Houthis combined with the conventional capabilities of the Yemeni army are capable of bringing the Saudi kingdom of Mohammed bin Salman to its knees. And that's essentially why I think he's suing for peace, or if he isn't, he better. A triple checkmate for the Houthis against Riyadh. Firstly, they showed that they had enough local support, which is a point I also made within Saudi Arabia, to have ready internal saboteurs in the event of an all-out war with Iran or Yemen. Important point, train station. Um, I think those drones were launched from inside Saudi Arabia, eastern province. The majority are the Shia natural allies of the Houthis and the Iranians, particularly 
given how downtrodden they have been. With the Houthis enjoying a high level of leverage through a combination of missile capabilities, the holding of many prisoners of war and saboteurs spread throughout Saudi Arabia, apropos a strange fire occurred in Jeddah on Sat Sunday at the Al Haramain railway station, it may be time for Riyadh to accept the tragic consequences of this useless war and sit down at the negotiating table with the Ansarullah. Washington and Tel Aviv will try in every way to prevent such negotiations, but if Mohammed bin Salman and his family wish to save their kingdom, it is better to start talking to the Houthis immediately. Otherwise, it is only a matter of time before another attack by Asarola leads to the complete collapse and ruining of the House of Saud and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. 16th of September, I wrote about these drone strikes deep inside the kingdom, and I asked, and I said, the overwhelming geopolitical question is around the longevity of the House of Saud and its crown prince, who is, of course, the proud owner, as you know now, of Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi, which means saviour of the world, and according to Robert Bayer, has so many enemies that he sleeps on his $500 million yacht, the Serene of Jeddah, and then on the 23rd of September, I said, you know, my conclusion remains that we're at a peacock throne moment for the House of Saud. Um, and that many people tend to miss inflection points. And therefore, I'm very, very bullish about the price of oil. I know it's been falling quite dramatically, but I think, and I'm hoping we've based out now. Um, but I'm looking at it uh, uh, in next year because, you know, the nature of the denouement is it does not happen as quickly as people think. Uh, the Shah of Shahs ended up in Panama all on his lonesome looking out to sea, and there is another fellow, not unlike the fictional Dean Jocelyn in the Spire, with a $500 million yacht called the Serene, who will most likely be looking out to sea in the not too distant future. 30th of September, I said, no number of Patriot missiles batteries can protect the House of Saud and its Salvatore Mundi now. The enemy is no longer at the border, it's on the inside. 13th of November, nearly two years ago, I said that then 30-year-old Crown Prince MBS arrived on the scene and immediately launched an unwinnable war in the Yemen. It's not winnable. The Yemenis are fighting each Yemeni fighting is worth 10 Saudi mercenaries because they're fighting for their country. The others are fighting for a paycheck. And that's why you're getting these situations. Um, and then I was quoting John Kemp, who said, it is clear now that the Yemen war has become Saudi Arabia's Vietnam. Here it is. This is from BBC Lorac, who seems to be on a uh, hot hotline with uh, Dominic Cummings. This is the UK proposal. I'm still, you know, it's fiendishly complicated, the whole business. And that. But I'm just looking at the language, the linguistics, and the tenor of it, and I'm saying to myself, there's been a significant mood change, hasn't there? President Z will have to let the renminbi go, I was saying over the weekend, and that I thought you should sell the renminbi, essentially, because there will be an almighty hangover once the party's over. We've had it strengthen a little bit to 7.1375, but I think it's going to give thick after this, you know, in, in the next few months. This is a chart from the market here, who's a great resource and I'm relying on immensely. Um, and then on the 13th of August, I said the feedback loop phenomenon um, and the most important currency to watch right now is the renminbi. Currency markets, uh, we had that soft PMI data which has weakened the dollar sum. The euro is currently at 109.45, dollar index 99.181, Japanese yen 107.26, Swiss franc 0.9966, uh, the pound 122.93, the Australian dollar 0.6712, India rupee 71.21, South Korean 112.0606, the real, Brazilian real 4.1433, Egyptian pound 16.33, and the rand 15.274 at 40. Look, we've had bouts of this before. Uh, you know, the data globally is bad. 
the US economy is not a manufacturing economy, we always get these overreactions. So I still expect uh, uh, the dollar to continue higher. This is a Bloomberg dollar index I got from Viraj Patel uh, of social media. Euro dollar, where are we there? 109.47. It's been a grind. It is grinding higher and I'm keeping an eye on it. I certainly wouldn't like it to pop over 110. This is a gold chart from Adam Mancini. We've come back quite nicely. We're right at 14.98. Let's see whether we can, I think if we get a weak non-farm payroll number, we're gonna go back up towards 15.20 and even 15.40. Crude oil, $52.57. This is a chart from T Commodity, who's seeing a bit of a turnaround after a very dramatic sell-off, or not as dramatic as in the stock market, of course. Sub-Saharan Africa, on a percentage basis, all 10 countries that are projected to experience the biggest growth in population by 2100 are in Africa, led by Niger, 581% increase, Angola, 473% increase, Tanzania, 378% increase, this is Pew Research, now, I've written about it separately. Look, there's going to be no demographic dividend unless there are jobs, and that's not clear that there are going to be, and that's the concern. And, you know, the, the, if it's no dividend, it's a time bomb, and like it was in Wagadougou in 2014 for beautiful Blaise Compaore, about which we've spoken about before. Government debt has surged from 20% of GDP a decade ago to a projected 91.6% this year, uh, prompting the IMF to warn that Zambia is at high risk of debt distress. Its bonds are trading at 70 cents in the dollar, and there is no way out like that very good film a few years ago. Zambian Finance Minister Bwalia Gandu plans to obtain almost 10% of the Southern African nation's total income next year from undisclosed sources, quaaludes and quaaludes. Big problems in Zambia, in my view. I wrote about it severally, and in fact, somebody took a screenshot of what I'd written, distributed in Zambia, and I got news that I was beset on grata. Zambia, of course, snapped earlier in the year, and I don't see how they're going to get out of this. It's going to have to be a catharsis. Huge quantities of frozen chickens, rice, fabric, and cars arrive at the port of Cotonou, Benin's economic capital, where they are taxed locally before being routed often illegally to Nigeria. This is the closing off of the border by the Nigerians of the border with uh, uh, Benin. Benin has few functioning petrol stations, its fuel is far more expensive than in Nigeria where it is subsidized by the state. A common site is smuggled Nigerian petrol sold by the side of the road in jerry cans. Beyond contraband, though, trade with Nigeria is crucial for Niger and Benin. Ranking among the world's poorest countries, they find themselves as David opposite the Nigerian Goliath, the market of 190 million in Africa's biggest economy. In Benin, business people in some parts of the economy are panicking, and unfounded rumors that Nigeria will even go so far as to cut off its electricity supply are spreading in local newspapers. Buhari and his country want to put an end to us, said Barthelemy Agon, a pineapple producer. He, like many others, have been hard hit by fruits and vegetables no longer being exported to their big neighbour. As for taxi and truck drivers, it's barely worth the effort to hit the road since a litre of imported contraband fuel has risen by about one euro since the frontier was closed. We're suffering seriously from this situation. Without petrol, we can't do anything, said a motorcycle taxi driver. I beg the Nigerian president to have pity on us, he said. But if his stony reputation is anything to go by, Buhari, an ex-general whose first spell as Nigeria's leader in the 1980s came after a coup, is unlikely to be merciful. Rwanda has charged 25 suspected rebels with an attempt to overthrow the government. A group of 25 men appeared before a military tribunal in Kigali as suspected operatives of the rebel group, the Rwanda National Congress, 
which the government labelled as a terror organisation. The RNC is mainly composed of former allies of President Kagame, now a bit of foes, residing mainly in exile. They have a Maoist approach to their opponents. This is the statement the United States is proud to announce, the re-establishment of the United States Embassy in Mogadishu, um, and then Tibor Nagy, the re-establishment of the U.S. Embassy in Mogadishu today is a sign of our commitment to partner with Somalia in its effort to build a stable, credible, and democratic country. There's a lot of oil there, top ten, by all accounts. Zimbabwe to introduce first Zimbabwe dollar notes in November. Uh, we'll put them into circulation in November, said Eddie Cross, a member of the MPC. Zimbabwe has been chronically short of paper cash, forcing most transactions onto electronic platforms such as mobile money system Eco Cash. We have insufficient cash in the system to meet people's needs for transactions, Cross told the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation. The new note should do away with the queues of the banks and people then should have adequate money for daily use. The Zimbabwean dollar was reintroduced in June in electronic form after being abolished in 2009 following a bout of hyperinflation. They're undergoing a bout of hyperinflation again, although they're no longer releasing the data. A lot of people think it's around the 900% mark. As I said in January, money is the most universal and most efficient system of mutual trust ever devised. Um, cowrie shells, this is Yuval Nair, and dollars have value only in our common imagination. Their worth is not inherent in the chemical structure of the shells and paper or their color or their shape. In other words, money isn't a material reality, it's a psychological construct. It works by converting matter into mind. And this is fundamentally the problem for Zimbabwe because the mind game that Zanu PF played on its citizens has evaporated in a puff of smoke. And, You've got to narrow that trust gap, and I don't see how they're going to do it. Um, and the point I'm making, which I made in January, is there's a correlation between high inflation and revolutionary conditions, and Zimbabwe is a classic example. South African oil shares up 2.4% year to date, dollar around 15.28, 14.50, 15.50 range, now going up back towards the top of the range. Egyptian pound 16.339. EGX30 up 10.32% year to date. Nigeria all share minus 13.09% year to date. Uh, Ghana Stock Exchange down 11.96% year to date. Namibia's credit rating was downgraded to double B with a stable outlook down from BB+. In Sub-Saharan Africa there is no economy with an investment grade rating by Fitch. South Africa and Namibia remain the two highest rated economies with BB plus and BB ratings respectively. Fantastic article in Madagascar, the dead are dug up so they can party with the living. Music, food and love are poured into the Fama Dihana festival. I'm teetering on the roof edge of a concrete tomb, the air is filled with the scent of sweat and rum and I'm being jostled from all sides by excitable dancing men hollering announcements in Malagasy to the surrounding crowd of two or three thousand people. The crowd waits eagerly, many of them clutching rolled up straw mats. They demand the men dig faster and bring out their dead. This is Fama Dihana, or the Turning of the Bones, a festival for the dead held in the highlands of Madagascar. Every five to seven years, people honor their ancestors by exhuming them from the family tomb and wrapping them in fresh shrouds. Eric, I say, gripping the dusty pink cross on top of the tomb. Did you say this is all one family? Yes, Lala has 15 siblings, and that's normal. So if they all grow up and get married, they each have 15 children. It's simple math. The importance of ancestors in Madagascar is visible to the naked eye as we drove across the red earth topped with patches of faded green grass. I noticed tombs made of concrete and granite sitting on hills, watching over villages of tiny houses made of mud, sticks and straw. I feel a knock in the back of my head. It's a freshly wrapped corpse on the shoulders of three men who laugh and say, as a fadi, sorry, cadavers are being lifted into the air all around us. 
I shut the car door and gaze into the rear view mirror. Barely able to process what I've just seen, Eric starts the engine. The wheels puff clouds of dust into the air behind us, obscuring the family of thousands, dancing with their dead under a setting sun. The bareback tree is the common name of a genus of trees, Adansonia. There are nine species, six species live in the drier parts of Madagascar. I've always wanted to go. Kenyans, apparently, 7.3 billion shillings uh, was extinguished out of these 1,000 shilling no demonetization program. In total, 209.6 billion was returned by the end of September 30th deadline. There must have been a big rush because about eight days ago, they were talking about 100 billion not being returned. I expected a bigger extinguishment than 3.48%. The CBK acting chair, you've got to look at this, this came via Money Academy. Treasury sets targets, it doesn't meet, treats austerity as mere conversation. Development allocations go unspent or mutate to recurrent spending in lip service to development. And that took me back to Andrew Mellon, purge the rottenness out of the system. And then uh, high costs of living and high living will come down. People will work harder, live a more moral life. Values will be adjusted and enterprising people will pick up the rents from less competent people. The Nairobi oil shares up 4.15% year to date. NSC 20 is down 13.69% year to date. And if you want to look into any share at the Nairobi Stock Exchange, just click on the final link on Rich Wrap-Ups. And thank you. I do appreciate you stopping by, I must say.